Uh, so we're gonna talk about gas furnaces. This is a very Florida uh, gas furnace class because we're gonna work on an 80% and I'm not gonna teach this the way that you would learn from NCI or Jim Bergman or folks who work on a lot of furnaces. Um, this is a very practical class for the way that we do it at Kalos and um, well, the way we need to do it at Kalos. Maybe some of you aren't following all this, but um, these, are, these are all pretty simple practices. We're gonna cover it from the top. So, flame, rapid oxidation, produces heat as a byproduct. What do we need for flame? What's the flame triangle? Fuel. Fuel. Air. Oxygen. Lose, you lose. Oxygen, not air. You know, we wouldn't need any air. You wouldn't need any nitrogen, although nitrogen is very explosive. <laughs> yeah. Oh, good times. Combustion. And then you need some sort of heat source. You need something that's going to actually initiate combustion. Um, really, you know, with certain types of fuel gases, you wouldn't necessarily even need any abnormal uh, heat source. All right, so that's what we're, that's what we're doing. And, and in terms of uh, one of the things that I'm gonna talk to you a lot about is the idea of combustion air, controlling this oxygen part of it, because that's where it starts to get dangerous if we don't provide enough oxygen for flame or we don't have proper mixing of oxygen with flame then we start to get carbon monoxide, which is no bueno. This class, I'm not gonna focus a lot on um, things that, we're not, that we don't do here, like clocking meters and gas input levels and all that kind of thing, because it's just not something that we care about that much, because here we're not working with efficiencies uh, where tweaking at 1% is gonna make a big difference. We don't have a very long uh, heating season, so we're just gonna focus on some things you need to know for our market, like I've already mentioned. But there's a lot more to this in terms of the math and science of combustion and so on and so forth. All right, we use two different types of gases typically. Um, actually, it is more than two, but we call them two different types of gases. And what are those two different types of gases we work with? Natural and propane. Natural and, you said propane? Propane, okay. LP. So LP. LP stands for what? Low pressure. Well, it can stand for low pressure. But what does it stand for in this case? Liquid. Liquid. Liquefied petroleum, liquid petroleum, right. And it's not just propane. We kind of use them interchangeably, um, but LP can actually be a mixture of butane or propane or just propane or just butane, and it can, it can kind of be either or. Now they have very similar properties. Um, and uh, you can see here that both propane and butane, which are what make up LP, are heavier than dry air and natural gas is lighter than dry air. So that means that when you have a natural gas leak, that natural gas is going to travel up and escape, where when you have an LP leak, that's going to sink down. Now, either way, we're burning a gas. I think some people get confused because they hear liquefied petroleum or liquid petroleum, and they imagine that it's a liquid going into the furnace, and it's not. It's a gas. Either way, it's a gas. But if you're burning LP or propane, uh, then it is heavier than air, which does make it a little bit more dangerous. Why? Why does it make it more dangerous when you're dealing with LP? based on what I just said. What's that? Oxygen. Well, it displaces oxygen, yeah. So, I mean, it could actually suffocate you, but it would be really dangerous before it got to that point. It's because it's flammable and it fills the room up from the bottom up. So when natural gas leaks, it tends to dissipate and escape uh, the space. Whereas with LP, it's gonna kind of sit at the floor and it's gonna fill from the floor up. Now it's still gonna kind of mix around and all that, but that does tend to make it a little bit more, a little bit more dangerous. With every fuel mixture, you can have uh, it be too rich or too lean to the extent that it won't burn. So when you get above <clears throat> a 15% of natural gas in the air, it'll actually get so rich that it will stop burning. Now, does that mean that it ceases to be dangerous? Well, obviously not, because as soon as it dilutes down to below that 15% level, then you're in the combustible space again. If you have 4.3% or less, then it's too lean and it won't burn. So everything has these, everything that's a fuel has these levels of concentration that are required for, for combustion. And so when we talk about things like, um, and you, some of you may not even know a lot about this, but like A2L refrigerants that are coming out, like R32, where you're gonna hear a lot about combustible refrigerants moving forward. There's a big difference between R32, which is an A2L combustible refrigerant, and R290, which is propane. They have much different levels of concentrations that are required for combustion. So 
whereas uh, R32, you could actually even have a spark and it's not gonna ignite. You'd actually have to have an open flame. You have a spark with R290 and see what happens. Answer fire. Fire is what happens, yes. Which, what is fire again? What is flame? Rapid oxidation of fuel resulting in a release of heat, obviously. Come on. It's rusting the air. It is actually rusting the air, yes. So oxidation does mean that there's a bonding with oxygen, which is why oxygen is necessary. So it's not, again, air is a constituent part, but oxygen is a constituent part of air, but it is not air, it's not the same. You know about what percentage of air is equals oxygen. How much of the air that you breathe is oxygen? Anyone know? We've got a 5%, anyone else? Under 50%. Under 50%, okay. All right, good. 69%. Nathan says 69%. Uh, no, uh, yes, yeah, 69% nitrogen, which is also very explosive. <laughs> uh, one time Nathan said nitrogen was explosive, and that's just my favorite thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, oxygen is about 20%. Uh, nitrogen is about about 70, just under 70%. So 90% of our air is made up of oxygen and nitrogen, and then we have water vapor and so a lot, bunch of other stuff. So now we're gonna talk about the sequence of operations. So we're kind of jumping a little bit ahead here, but I do wanna get right to this because the point of this class is to make you much more comfortable working on gas furnaces. Uh, and the sequence of operation, regardless of the type of furnace, is actually pretty, pretty consistent. So the first thing, the furnace receives a W call. When I say a W call, what do I mean by that? What's another way of saying that? Call for heat. Call for heat. 24 volts applied to the W terminal, the white wire, whatever, right? And that, that 24 volts ends up on the furnace board, on the furnace board W. Now, do we need a G call as well no. with the gas furnace and heat? No. no? Any other opinions? Got to know here? Depends. Nathan says it depends on what? Well, I don't know. <laughs> okay. No, you do not. There is no furnace that I'm aware of that requires a G call in heat. Some electric uh, fan coils, so if you electric only, do require it, especially older ones. But nowadays in heat, which is actually why, if you remember the old thermostats, it would have a selector that would say you would select the, um, the heat source, whether it was electric heat or gas. And that was the main reason for that was it would switch between whether you had a G call or not. In fact, we had a set of uh, Lennox furnaces that we had a set of thermostats that were, that were creating a G call in cooling and they would just lock out right, right off the bat. And so we had to go in and do something to them. I don't remember what we did, but you don't want a G call <clears throat> in heat. Why don't you want a G call in heat? Anybody know? Why don't you want 24 volts on G at the furnace board in heat on a gas furnace? because the fan kicks on before the flame and we'll have enough oxygen. The first part of it is correct. The second part, not quite. The first what part, issue? what's that? Is that like a rollout issue, a flame rollout issue? No, not really. It's, it's that you don't want it, a couple reasons. The main reason for the customer is that you don't want it circulating cold air before the furnace lights. That's kind of the main and old school reason for it. You know, you live, say you live in a really cold climate, <clears throat> the ducts are you know really cold and you're just moving a bunch of air through these just cold air blowing on people, makes them uncomfortable. But there's actually another reason, and that is that we want to be able to observe, this is actually kind of a servicer's reason, we want to be able to observe that flame before the blower starts, and then observe it after the blower starts. So, just as a quick, really important thing to know, when you're testing a gas furnace, you see we have this external panel that's already off, right? This outside panel that's off, but do we leave this panel off when we're testing it, this inside blower panel? The answer is no, this must be on when we're testing the furnace. Because if it's not, then we're not separating the airstream from the combustion air zone. So imagine two different zones. We have the combustion zone where the flames go through and we can see right into it because this is open combustion, right? We have this area and then we have the area where the air is circulating into the home. If those two aren't separated from each other, then you're gonna be drawing potentially unspent gas, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, whatever, into the home, uh, which is not a good idea, right? So that has to be closed. But what we do is we start it up. At first, the blower is not on, right? We see the flame, we're watching it, and then all of a sudden the blower comes on. 
What are we watching for? Anybody know? Roll out. You said roll out, what'd you say? Wiggly flame. We're watching for wiggly flame. Yep, that's what you're watching for. You're watching for a change in the flame. Really any change. You can see all of a sudden, you know, a change to some orange, starts to, starts to move more. And the reason why, what would be the possible reason why when the blower is off, the flame would be nice and straight and normal. And then when the blower goes on, you'd get a wiggly flame. Crack and heat exchanger. Crack heat exchanger, right. And it would be a pretty significant crack, right? And truthfully, again, this, this is a Florida thing versus another market thing. In other markets, they spend a lot of time focusing on cracked heat exchangers because in other markets, they have a much longer season and there's much more opportunity, many, much more cycling. And so the, the metal is stressed more and then it cracks more in Florida. Cracked heat exchangers on furnaces that are under 20 years old, yeah, pretty abnormal. I mean, I, I've honestly never seen it. Actually, there was a commercial unit I saw it on. But even then, I think it was like a condensation issue. So it's not, it's not a real common thing. It's not something we need to do this like excessive testing on. But if you watch the flame before the blower comes on and it's nice and straight, and then the blower comes on and the flame stays nice and straight, then we're gonna say it's okay to move on to the next step. Now. What would happen, what's the first thing you should do if you're watching it and you do notice the blow, the flame start wiggling? Kill it. What's that? Kill it. Shut it off, okay. What's another reason why the flame could start wiggling other than a heat exchanger leak? Good music, inducer motor. No, nope. not inducer motor. It would be some other sort of air leakage. So if there was, because again, um, We've got this panel really close to this thing. Imagine that there's a big leak right here where that panel is right underneath the right underneath the burner. And now when that blower comes on, it's sucking a bunch of air in there. That could also result in a wiggly flame. Now it's something you should still solve. That's a that's a problem that you need to solve, but it's not a cracked heat exchanger. Right? So you'd want to figure out is it a cracked heat exchanger or is it something else, some other air leak that's exchanging air between the combustion air zone where you're burning the flame and the air in the home. Again, useful thing to have diagnosed and to resolve. Does that make sense? Make sense everybody? All right, so let's keep going through the sequence. We kind of jumped ahead. Step one, furnace receives a W call. Step two, inducer fan starts. Now, before the inducer fan even starts, the circuit board checks. And when we say checks, I mean, it's not like it has a brain look. Let me check, it's just all part of the circuitry. But it checks to see, is that inducer fan starting open? So if, if, it, if you receive a W call and the inducer fan is, uh, or the, sorry, the, the switch, the pressure switch is closed before the inducer fan even starts, the board will lock out. Because the purpose of the pressure switch, that's this guy right here, right here, is to prove that we have inducer air, that we're moving air, that we are inducing a draft, right? And so if we're not inducing a draft, that this little guy isn't, isn't measuring a negative pressure, then it shuts the system off, that's the design. But on the other side, imagine that that switch got stuck closed or somebody jumpered it out. You wouldn't want the board to think, well, it's always got inducer fan just because somebody put a jumper across it. So when that thing starts up, it checks first to see, is it, does it start open? Because if it doesn't start open, it won't even let it start. That makes sense? The switch has to start open before this fan starts spinning. This is, this is our inducer fan that draws air into the burners. If this starts closed, locks out. How it should work is this starts open, then it starts the inducer fan, then this closes, and now the furnace knows that you have proven indu inducer air. Go ahead. Is that only a carrier thing? No. Nope. checks for that? Nope. Because I've jumped out pressure switches on systems to see if the pressure switch is the issue. Well, again, you can jump it out once it's already past that part of the sequence. So once it's already past the open check, mm -hmm. um, now to, to start it up with it jumped out, I don't know of anyone that should work that way. Um, super old. Maybe, yeah, maybe if it's really old, uh, possible. I've done it on like brand new Goodman's. 90% because they have two to three pressure switches on them. Um, and like one goes bad and I've like jumpered one out to test the system and then replace it, you know, a day later or whatever it is. Some start off closed. A brand, there's a brand that starts off closed and then goes open? With multiple pressure switches, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, not for, I'm not familiar with it and I haven't worked on many 90s. <clears throat> so 
Regardless, it's always going to prove one position. It's going to check for one position and then it's going to uh, notice that it goes to the other position with multiple switches. If some of them are secondary, may maybe not. Um, but again, for a standard 80 that you're going to work on in Florida, that's the, that's the normal thing. Now, again, it's not, it's not going to come up much other than if you try to jump it. And I guess that for you, having not seen that before, you wouldn't want to jump it right off the bat and then start it because it still won't work, even if the switch is working. The right way to test a pressure switch is to actually hook up a manometer to the port and then look at the actual reading and see first if that switch or if the, uh, if the inducer is actually producing that negative pressure that you're supposed to produce and then put it back on the switch and see if the switch is closing or opening. It's easy to prove whether a switch is closing or opening. You just take the, the leads off and, and, uh, and ohm it out. If you suck on it, that's what a lot of people do, but you can actually A, damage the switch doing that, and you're also producing far more pressure than that inducer actually produces. So just the fact that it closes when you suck on it doesn't mean it's gonna close with a proper draft. And again, one of the main reasons why <clears throat> pressure switches don't close isn't because there's a problem with the pressure switch it's because there's a problem with something in the flue assembly or some you know a bird stuck in the inducer or whatever so you only the only way that that switch is going to close is if there's sufficient negative pressure in order to close the switch and so when one isn't closing it could be the switch but it also could be the assembly and that's how you can tell the difference you just take your manometer hook it up and see how much negative pressure are you getting compared to that to the switch if it's less than it should be or on the low end go ahead and figure out what's blocking the flu or what's going on with the inducer so inducer fan starts pressure switch ensures a proper draft and it does that generally with a negative pressure so it's just measuring a negative pressure on the negative side now again this is kind of an interesting thing it's not going to come up much but if you're working on an 80 percent furnace and you were to measure the pressure in the flu pipe what kind of pressure do you think you would get just guess. Positive. Positive pressure? Sure, that makes sense. Anyone else? Go ahead. No, it's just been a point of contention. <laughs> it's been a point of contention, yes. Uh, but you actually measure a negative pressure in the flu in reference to the outside. Okay, and there becomes a point where it does become positive. This is a really short one. So, but on a standard flu that you would have, where it's going out through the roof, if you measure it by the appliance, by the furnace, you're actually gonna measure a negative pressure. And that's because the force of those gases traveling up through the stack, through the flue, are actually creating a negative pressure below and a positive pressure above. It's like, a, it's, you know, Jim Bergman always says, it's like you know, trying to blow into a, into a shop vac hose, trying to blow into a vacuum hose. You can create a positive pressure in one sense because you are drawing air in, but there's actually more force associated with those hot gases traveling up that's creating a negative pressure down there at the bottom where we measure. So that's why we call it an inducer. That's why we don't call it like a draft booster or something, because it's not creating positive pressure in the flu. It's just inducing air in. It's, it's used in order to draw air in through these more complicated uh, heat exchangers. There was a time when heat exchangers were super simple, and we'll, and we'll look at that, where they were pretty much just straight up and down, and everything could just move really easily. Well, now they're much more complicated, a lot of different types of designs, and so that inducer fan is there to suck air in in order to overcome that pressure so that we can provide the right amount of air and oxygen to the flame. Make sense? Now, if it was a 90%, it would be positive, because they actually are um, it's that much pressure and by the time it gets up to the by the time it gets to the flu it's such a low temperature that it doesn't want to go out you actually have to push it out um, and that's why we can go sideways with it and all that other stuff because you're not actually at that point you're just using your you're just using your uh, draft blower to push it out all right so once we've ensured the proper amount of air now we go into the ignition sequence and the ignition sequence starts with what anybody know Igniter, right. Now the igniter can be a couple different types of igniters and we're gonna talk about that, but there's gonna be something that's there to ignite the gas. Once the igniter has had sufficient time to either heat up or start sparking or whatever it is, then the gas valve opens. Gas valve opens and it's going to, uh, in the case of intermittent spark ignition, it's first gonna light a pilot and then the main gas valve is gonna open. But either way, you're gonna start flowing flame. It's gonna prove that you have gas and it's going to do that with some type of a flame rod an eye something there is going to prove that the flame is burning and why does it do that why do we need to make sure that that flame is burning 
Otherwise, it's just putting out gas. Otherwise, unspent gas is just filling the thing and you're creating a bomb. So there's, a, there's two major risks, even more than that, but the two most common risks associated with the gas furnace are unspent gas building up, which creates explosions, right? So that's one obvious one. And the other is carbon monoxide. And then generally just fire hazards, right? If you've got a flue that's getting flaming hot and it's sitting up next to a truss or something, it could cause a fire hazard or roll out, could cause a fire. You know, there's lots of things like that. Um, so we need to make sure that if we are pushing gas through this furnace, we're pushing gas into the burner, that that gas is lit. And the most common way that we do that is with something called a flame rod or a flame rectifier. We'll talk more about how that works in, in a minute, but that's just there to make sure that we've got flame. On older gas furnaces or on water heaters, does anybody know what they call the flame proving device in those? Flame sensor. Some people call it a flame sensor. It's got an old school name though. It's called a thermocouple or a thermopile. And in a thermocouple or a thermopile, um, those are traditionally for millivolt systems. It actually generates a voltage when, or generates a current when there is a flame on it. So it's a much more old school analog way of doing it without having to use modern digital controls. So you just basically, when there's a flame on this little rod, it generates a voltage that then can be used to actually energize the, um, uh, to, to, well, you're already, the gas valve's already energized because that's because you have a uh, intermittent spark or some other method. Um, not, sorry, not intermittent spark. Back up, standing pilot. Standing pilot is there, and then it lights the main burner. Blech. Once we've proven flame, so we've proven air, we've proven flame. Now we keep that gas valve locked in. So until all of this happens, this thing's going to just keep trying to restart until it locks itself out. We've got to prove airflow, we've got to prove flame, then the blower is going to start after sufficient time has passed. 30 seconds, 60 seconds, 90 seconds, whatever. Then the blower is going to start up and now we're moving heat through the house. And so for us, we can actually observe that entire sequence of operations. After that time, if anything changes, if all of a sudden the system is no longer proving flame, all of a sudden the flame rod isn't sensing flame anymore, it's going to shut it off, it's going to start over. If all of a sudden our, uh, our pressure switch drops out, so we're not proving air, it's gonna shut off. But then we also have a series of other safeties as well that can shut off the system. We're gonna talk more about that. So here are our standard types of ignition. And really, this pretty much sums it up. You have standing pilot. Standing pilot, you light the pilot light. If you've ever had one of these on a you know, water heater, wherever you turn the thing, you push it in, it sparks. It runs a little bit of gas through here. It lights the pilot light. The thermocouple proves that you have flame on the pilot light. And the assumption is if you got flame on the pilot light, your pilot, then when you open the gas valve, it will always, it will always ignite. I mean, it's a pretty good assumption. There are some things that could happen. You could have like a serious amount of rust or a, a plate or something that falls down that gets in the way of it and then it still doesn't ignite and that's super dangerous. But generally speaking, if you got an open flame, has anybody ever done this where you light your grill by just lighting one of the burners and you just close the top, open the others until it lights all the way across? I do it all the time. You're not supposed to do it, but, but it's like you light it and then it just kind of sits and then goes all the way through when, you know, when all your little spark igniters are, are broken. So if you were to have an excess, because that's going to be on the first burner, right? Yeah. That's where the gas is coming in. If you would have an excess of rust build up on your burners, would that Where it's not high? crossing over. You yeah, have... it would just eventually, so it would, then this is what I'm saying. This is kind of the example. It's not safe or a good idea, mm -hmm. but eventually what would happen is it would light the first one. The other ones would keep having unspent gas go in, and then eventually enough of that concentration would build up that it would go boom, and then it would all light. Okay. And you may, if you were standing right in front of it, you may get a little roll out, whatever. It's like not a good thing. Uh, but that's, you know, that's one of the challenges with this design is that there is the assumption that if the pilot is lit, that the main burners are just safe to open because there's nothing monitoring the main burner. The other thing about pilot lights and, and this old kind of thermocouple design is that you're just running gas 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all the time. You're always burning a little flame, which just is a stupid waste of energy if you don't have to do it. The other thing is, is that because they work on a millivolt type system, it's kind of unreliable too. Any poor connections, any corrosion are going to lead to problems with it. So and there's still a lot of pool heaters out there that work on this type of system. You're going to walk up to the pool heater and there's not any, there's no wires leading to it. What was the one that happened with Tyler recently? What was that? Oh, oh that's right. He's like, he's, <laughs> that was what it was. He said, uh, I, I came into this furnace and it just had a fire going all the time. So I shut it off. I was unsafe. <laughs> They're still out there. I mean, you'll, you'll still see them. <laughs> yeah, that Tyler. Uh, 
Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> call call this thing's on fire. <laughs> call back all myself. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> Did you actually do that once? <laughs> Off the gas in summer. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's not, and that's actually why, in a lot of places, they do that on purpose. They will shut it off, and then every season, you got to light the pilot light. You'll still get some old timers who ask that. Uh, you got to come light the pilot light. And if you had, yes, for $75. <laughs> yeah, if you had, yeah, for, if you had, yeah, right, you buy a lot of gas for that. Um, but you know, that's the design, that's how it used to be. And so you had to light it every time. And you'll still, like I said, you'll still see them. Next is direct spark. Now this isn't, I mean, this is a form of direct spark, but when you light your grill and you push that button to light the main burner, that is a form of direct spark. You're using a spark, you know, click, 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 and it's directly lighting the main burner. That is not common in furnaces, but Ream Roo does use that design. So it's just a, a, it's a spark ignition and it just opens the main burner and the spark sparks and it lights the main burner. So you will see that it doesn't look like this, but this is just an easy way for you to kind of get your head around how it works. The next is intermittent spark, ISI, intermittent spark ignition. So if you ever see ISI anywhere, that's what that means. And that is where you have a pilot, but it's not lit all the time. You light the pilot with a spark and you light the main burner with the pilot. That's why it looks very similar to this. But this is acting as both a flame sensing rod and a spark ignition in most cases. Sometimes there is a separate flame sensing, um, but typically that electrode does both of those purposes. So what will happen is it'll, the gas valve will send a little bit of gas to the pilot, then it will spark, tick, 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 lights the pilot, senses the flame of the pilot, and then allows the main burner to open. Again, this design is also relying on the fact that this pilot is going to light the main burner. And then by far the most common nowadays is hot surface ignition. Now this is a silicon carbide um, hot surface igniter. You're going to notice most of them nowadays don't look like this. Most of them nowadays just look like a single little rod. That's it. That's silicon nitride and that's far more common nowadays. They work basically the same way. There was a period where Train used this like voltage modulating system where it would keep dropping down the voltage and all that. But um, hot surface igniters are a f common fail item in gas furnaces. Um, so if you go to one that's you know seven, eight, nine, ten years old and it's not working, it's a good chance that it could be the hot surface igniter. And sometimes it's because you know the flame is maybe too hot or something like that. But in a lot of cases, it's just the cycle times. Just eventually they fail. Um, also, if they if there is short cycling. Uh, that can also increase the likelihood that they will fail. Your gas valve is what actually opens and puts gas into your main burner. The place you do your testing on your gas valve is in these little ports right here. And then you're gonna have um, some larger looking screw that you take off and you adjust your, your gas pressure. Now, if you have a, a multi-stage valve, then you may have multiple points that you adjust. It's all actually quite simple. Um, but the first time you do it, especially for Florida boys, it's like, oh my gosh, this is super complicated. This is so scary. So this is what we're gonna focus on today is testing gas pressure and just kind of running through the sequence of operation and all that hands-on. These are the things you don't wanna find in your pocket when you get home. Correct, <laughs> these things right here, if you find them in your pocket when you get home, I don't know what you should do. Just move to another state. Just keep driving. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it is actually, I mean, it's not, it, it is a pretty small amount of gas. Um, so you should just drive straight back and, you know, plug it back up again. Like, I left my tools in your unit. Yeah. Um, some of you may not have seen these types though. There's a type of gas valve called a Gemini valve. And it has a port that looks something like this. And on Gemini valves, um, you actually shut it off, you just crack open the port, and then you put your adapter right over it. So you're not actually taking anything out. And that's actually, I, my understanding is that's the reason why they designed this this way, is because it is much less likely that you're going to do what we just talked about. Because literally when you pull the thing off, it's, you know, it's still open. All you got to do is just, all you got to do is just close it down. It's less likely you're going to lose them or forget them or whatever. Uh, and then also the flow rates are going to be really low coming out of those as well. I have a video just specifically on Gemini valves. This is your pressure switch, inducer air proving switch, whatever you want to call it. It's just proving that you have air. And there will be uh, somewhere on it, you're going to find uh, a location that's going to tell you what the negative pressure will be that activates the switch. And so you can use that to test it. They're actually, a field piece makes a, and I don't know if you have that one in here, but field piece makes a manometer. 
I think it's the SDM6. Yeah, this guy right here. Is this the, no, this is the more basic one. Uh, no, this is the one. Yeah, it has a pump on it. So we can actually do this. That's cool. So it has a pump on it. And so you can actually use that to test your pressure switch um, to see if it opens and closes at the right design pressure. It's actually a really nice feature. Kind of a special thing about that particular uh, manometer. Every time I say manometer, I want to say manometer. Yeah. Uh-huh. Inducer blower, um, pretty basic. It's just a fan, a motor. It's a shaded pole motor. Um, doesn't have a capacitor. I mean, I guess there are some that do. I think I have actually seen some inducers that do, but generally it's just a shaded pole motor. It looks like this. Um, when you're working on pool heaters, the blades corrode out all the time, and that's a big cause of not proving air. Um, but when you're working on a gas furnace, the most common reason why they don't work is because something's blocking them. Um, another thing that can happen sometimes is just the tube that's leading in there could be blocked with something too. I've actually seen that. Um, sometimes it happens because water is getting into the flue, uh, and so it's causing a little bit of like buildup in there, and so that's another problem to solve. Uh, I think I sp we especially saw that like during some high winds and stuff if they didn't have proper roof caps. Um, but if you have a pressure switch that's not closing, just don't assume it's the pressure switch and replace the pressure switch. That's the, you have to make sure, is the pressure switch not closing when it's supposed to? If it's not, okay, then replace it. But don't just say it's not closing, so it's the pressure switch because it could be a bird stuck in here. There could be a bird stuck in the flue. Anything like that is gonna cause that problem. Ooh, those are some nice pictures. We've got rollout switches. Rollout switches are going to be in an obvious position, so that way they trip if the flame rolls out. These are just thermodiscs. It's a bimetallic disc. They get too hot, they open up. Very, very simple to test. Literally, are they open? Then they're tripped. Are they closed? Then they're not. And so that would be a matter of pull the wires off, take an ohmmeter, go across it, see if they're open or closed. High limit switch, same thing. When a furnace is going out on rollout, there's a reason. Switches don't fail in the open position without having tripped. So if it is rolling out, then figure out why, why it's rolling out. Modern furnaces rarely roll out. That's not a super common problem for modern furnaces. You're looking at me like, have you had them roll out on you? No, I've never um, seen a roll. Older, older furnaces where you didn't have an induced draft and you didn't have draft proving, that was actually quite common because you were literally just relying on gravity or, or you were literally just relying on the buoyancy of hot air in order to draw everything up through. So it's pretty common. Transformers do roll out. <laughs> Transformers roll out. <laughs> okay, I, I get it. Okay, I get it now. Wow. Um, but in the case of both, <laughs> in the case of both high limits, and rollouts, if they are tripped, figure out why, because there's going to be a reason. For high limits, the main reason why a high limit trips is what? What do you think? So high limit is furnace is getting too hot. Why do you think the furnace would get too hot? Airflow. Airflow, low airflow. That's the most common reason, right? So check all the normal things you would check for low airflow if it was a freezing evaporator coil. Dirty air filters, dirty evaporator coils. A lot of times people think, well, how can a dirty evaporator cause the, because anything that blocks the airstream is going to result in low airflow, it's going to result in high furnace temperature. An easy way to test that on a furnace is you do, um, you do what's called a temperature rise test. And it's just, it's, it's just the same as an as air temperature split and cooling. Return, supply, check the difference because inside the furnace, there is a number posted of what that should be. If you're not inside that range, if it's, or it's on the high side of that range, then just increase your heating airflow in order to get that where it should be, or figure out the cause, obviously figure out the cause first. Um, but that's a pretty good indication of, of what's causing it. All right, we're gonna go through our different furnace types. This is the kind that you're not gonna see much of. They're a lot of fun if you get to work on them. They have this thing called a unit. <laughs> if you think, um, a standing pilot is crazy, you wait till you see a fan limit switch. A fan limit switch uh, is this device that actually uh, is looking at the box temperature and it's the temperature of the, uh, of the inside of the furnace, of the heat exchanger, that causes it to turn via bimetal until it brings on the blower. So literally the blower, rather than being brought on by, because there is no electronics in them, rather than being brought on by an electronic board or a relay, is being brought on by this gigantic wrap of metal that as it changes temperature, 
it expands at different rates and then finally trips and brings the blower on. It's crazy, craziest thing. We had a bunch of them actually in, uh, there was a bunch of furnaces in Greater Hills uh, that, that, were, that had that, probably still some are. So this is a under 80% efficiency. You're gonna notice there's no inducer draft. A lot of them had no electronics at all in them. And in some cases, that's where you would have standing pilot. You might not even have any electricity going to the furnace. That's how crazy this is sometimes. The actual furnace part itself may not really have any electricity. Other, obviously, you got a blower motor, so that would be weird if you didn't have electricity going to that. But the actual furnace part um, was really just electromechanical at that time, or mostly mechanical. So when you see burners like this, that's your natural draft. These are what are called upshot burners the flames just go straight up you would have little shutters that you could adjust the air mixture going in and uh, they were much more volatile and that's where you would get a lot more roll out and that sort of thing you'd have uh, high high exhaust vent temperatures uh, coming out but very simple design this is our standard 80 percent non-condensing open combustion induced draft furnace so it's induced draft because we are inducing a draft we are pulling air into the heat exchanger we're actually drawing air in now on an 80 percent open combustion where is that air coming from on our typical furnaces we work on here in florida where is the air coming from for combustion around the furnace. just around the furnace wherever the furnace happens to be there's louvers in the front panel and wherever it happens to be it's just drawing air in which produces which creates a very big problem and that problem is do we have enough air? We can't jam these things in closets and just expect that they're gonna work because you've gotta be bringing in combustion air from around the furnace. So when we say open combustion, that's what we mean. It's just pulling air in from what we call the combustion air zone. It's the same thing is true of water heaters, same thing. When that water heater heats up, that, that flue gas is going out, we know it is, right? Where's the air coming from that replaces it? just wherever, right? So it negatively pressurizes the area it's in and it better have enough oxygen. Otherwise, as that oxygen level keeps decreasing, we get to a point where we have incomplete combustion, we start producing carbon monoxide. And it can actually get to the point where on some devices you can get, you can get um, rollout. Now, on an induced draft furnace, very unlikely you're gonna get rollout because you've got this inducer fan, but let's say that there's a water heater in this same space. Do we ever see that? A water heater in the same place as the gas furnace? all the time right so if that space is starving for air this guy here is sucking air in that space is going under negative pressure more and more what ends up happening to the water heater it ends up backdrafting right so it ends up where air is going the wrong direction and it starts trying to grab air from inside the space and that's where you'll see if you ever looked at the top of a water heater and you see like like rust and like like it's been burned on top of the water heater under the draft hood, that's what's have been happening, is it's been backdrafting. And it backdrafts generally not because of its fault, it's generally the other things that are in the room with it. And those are things to look for as a service technician, pay attention to that. The water heater in our market tends to be more dangerous than the furnace itself. This is what we call a um, uh, in-shot in burner or a gun burner is what some of the guys used to call it when I first started, I don't know why they called it that, but. Um, you tend to have more complicated heat exchangers. You have your induced draft fan, you have your pressure switch that proves it. And still, while it's still negative pressure at the top there, you are still moving air in for combustion. And then you have high efficiency condensing. So it's not only condensing, well, first off, what is it condensing? What's, what's condensing in a 90% condensing gas furnace? Anybody know? Air vapor. What's that? Air vapor. It's actually, so it is, condensing stuff out of the air, but it's condensing the products of combustion themselves. So you're actually cooling it so much that the products of combustion are condensing out and you're actually getting water. It's an acidic water. And so you got to do something with that, which is why you can't go, you can't really go above 80% or much above 80% efficiency with an 80% furnace. Otherwise you start creating water and now it starts rusting everything out. So when you work with a 90%, you're going to notice almost everything in here is plastic. You know, the exhaust vent, the induced draft fan, the collector box, all that's going to be plastics, um, sometimes stainless steels, uh, but they're going to be much, this is just a corrosive environment and you've got water involved. You also have the burners up top. 
And the reason is, is that now we're actually drawing air in, we're going down the other direction, and then we're going into a secondary heat exchanger, which looks like a big, kind of almost like a condenser sort of, it's like a big fin box, where it squeezes out that last little bit, and then that's where it condenses. And then it goes outside. But now it has to be under positive pressure because it's so low temperature, it's, you can put it in PVC. So you vent um, high efficiency furnaces through PVC. And it's- Why are there no louver doors in that one? Because it's sealed combustion. Good question. Thank you. I didn't, I didn't cover that. So you've got, you see you have two ports. So one would be your outlet and one would be your intake. And here it shows it. This is showing it just going out the side, but they're generally both going to go at the top. So you have outdoor air that's being drawn in into sealed combustion. And that's actually my favorite part of a 90% furnace. This is the part that I wish we would have in Florida. Makes a lot of sense. Rather than burning the air from just the space and having to have uh, combustion air grills going up into the attic or wherever, which is really annoying, right? Why do why we want a giant grill going up into the attic so that all summer it can just, you know, cause condensation issues and all kinds of uh, all kinds of issues? So with this, you're drawing in outdoor air, you're using that air for combustion, and then you're exhausting your products at combustion. Make sense? Much better design. The condensing part is the part I don't really care for because that's the part that creates other issues because now you have to have a separate drain on the furnace. You have to deal with the fact that it's acidic in some places. You got to treat it before it goes back into the sewer system. So it's just kind of a kind of an issue. Secondary heat exchangers tend to block up and fail on certain models. So it's just a it's a whole another thing. But the sealed combustion part is nice. All right. So what are our biggest dangers? I already talked about them. Number one, gas leaks. So let's talk about that. How do you check for gas leaks? What's the right way? How do you check for gas leaks, Sam? What's the right way to check for gas leaks, Sam? <laughs> Put a lighter Bubbles. around. See if you can... Huh? Bubbles. Bubbles, maybe, but again, you're dealing with a very low pressure assembly. So you can use bubbles, but bubbles aren't always going to. It's not like refrigerant, where you're dealing with hundreds of psi. You're dealing with inches of water column, rather than hundreds of psi. So, huh? Do they make a device? They make a device. It's called a combustible gas leak detector. Yeah, yeah. That's the right thing to use. Now, a lot of old timers will use a lighter and you may think, oh, that's horribly dangerous, right? Because in our heads, we imagine that this flame is going to burn back into the pipe or something like that. But that's really not how that works. Why? Why isn't that how it works? That it just burns back into the pipe? Because there's no oxygen. There's no oxygen in the pipe, right? So. Old timers will just take their lighter and they'll flick it around and you'll see a little flame shoot out and that's how they know. Now, I'm not telling you to do that, but that is a very normal way that it's been done in our trade for a long time. Uh, bubbles are your other option. One of the best options, though, is just your nose. Right? If you show up, and Bert did that video, if you show up to a space and you smell that methyl mercaptan smell, you smell that garlicky, I just had to say the fancy name for it, you smell that garlicky smell, um, that's an indication that you need to find what's causing it. Don't just do the whole, well, yeah, well, it's a furnace, so it's burning it. No, no, if it's burning it, then you don't smell it. So if you're smelling it, find the leak, figure out where it is. So yes, bubbles can sometimes find it, um, but really a combustible gas leak detector is the right tool to use. A lot of guys get confused and they, and they confuse combustible gas with carbon monoxide. Those are two totally different things. Combustible gas is unspent gas. It hasn't burned yet. Carbon monoxide is what happens when you burn gas and you don't have enough oxygen. And that's very dangerous because you don't smell it. You just get dead, right? You just get enough of it, you just get dead. So we don't want any level of carbon monoxide in or around the customer's home, um, which brings us to the point of like, when you're, <laughs> When you're working with customers who have furnaces, the thing that I wish we would do, and, I, and we still haven't gotten to it being a standard practice, but this is really, really what I want. You go to a customer, they have a furnace, you do all the right tests, but then at the end, you look to see if they have a low level carbon monoxide dete detector. If they do not have a low level carbon monoxide detector, you offer them one, literally in your hand. I can give this to you right now, it's X number of dollars. This protects against low levels of carbon monoxide. They may not kill you instantaneously, but can still make you sick, and it acts as an early detection device beyond what you have already in your house. I thought level up to 0 0.007 on a carbon monoxide reheater was safe. 0 0.007 on a carbon monoxide reheater. So it'd be, we generally read carbon monoxide in parts per million. Yes. And anything up to, so, so what they'll tell you is when you measure inside the flu, um, the more extreme folks will say over 300, you have to deal with under 300, you don't. I'm in the home, right? So if you have 
Oh, inside the home. Inside the home, if you were to measure the carbon dioxide inside the home, 0.007 is what? Inside the home, it should be zero. Okay. If it's not zero, then there needs to be a reason why it's not zero. Do they smoke in the home? Is, the, is it not zero outdoors? You know, so maybe they live in New York City. They live in a big city where there's carbon monoxide present everywhere. But if it's not zero inside the home, I want to know why. Maybe, maybe they are using the stove a lot. Um, there are studies that show even levels as low as three parts per million carbon monoxide regularly can cause um, some respiratory ailments and, and uh, mental uh, impairment. So you don't want it. You just don't want it in your house. Um, the issue with, um, and I don't remember what the actual um, UL rating is, but on standard carbon monoxide detectors, before they alarm, it's pretty high. It's like 100 parts per million or 50. It's, it's a high number before they start alarming. Um, and it could be bad enough that like they could actually die. It's good that they have those in there. Um, but if we put a low level carbon monoxide detector in the home, like a, I think Defender is the name of the common one that we use, I think, um, it really just eliminates that risk, that, that big risk that something went wrong with the furnace and uh, kind of eliminates not only our liability, but just, again, it's just one of those really like simple things that anybody who has a furnace, if I had a furnace in my house, I would have one, no doubt. And I'm not a worry wart. Um, so it's something that's just easy. It should be pretty easy for us to offer. And even if they decline, that's good because they declined then, you know. So much of the gas furnace market in other places is about optimizing for efficiency of the gas furnace. For us, I don't really care that much about that. I care about making sure that it's safe. They care about making sure it's safe too, but a lot of the reasons why they become unsafe is because they're getting really fine tuny with it. Whereas with us, I don't care if you have a bunch of excess air. I don't care if you're not burning fuel at the optimum efficiency. I just care if it's safe. And so if you're measuring your carbon monoxide in the combustion air zone, so around the furnace with your, car with your low level carbon monoxide detector, um, and you're doing it inside the space, maybe just set it on the counter while you're there, um, that alone is, is enough for me. I don't need you to do a combustion analysis on every service call or every maintenance. We do a combustion analysis when we set up a new piece of equipment. That's my, that's my policy for Max to go and do that uh, because now we're responsible for the whole thing. Uh, but if you go in and you're doing a maintenance and the thing's run for several years and there's no uh, ambient carbon monoxide and there's no carbon monoxide spillage around the unit uh, and you're doing all your other tests that you're supposed to do, watching for flame displacement, all this, I'm feeling pretty good about it. And at that point, we're already doing better than every single contractor in the state of Florida. So other than maybe Joel Becker. Joel Becker would be an exception. That guy, am I right? <laughs> That's Joel Becker. What a fancy boy. All right. So big things to look for. First, improper venting. So you'll see people do all kinds of crazy stuff. You'll see people use T-fin to vent gas furnaces uh, at times. You know, like, it'll, you know, t everybody knows what T-fin is, right? Thermofin, it's what they use for venting um, bath fans. So that's not designed for gas furnaces. Um, you'll see single wall uh, uh, venting that's right up against a truss, uh, right up against a combustible material, which it's not supposed to be. Um, so things like that, just pay attention. Uh, anything, anything that's obviously a problem. Uh, if it's disconnected, obviously that's a problem. Just things like that. Poor gas line installation. So that would be gas lines that are installed with obviously the wrong size, especially when they're using these gas connectors. Those are the most likely to leak um, because with vibration they leak or they can rub up against something. So make sure your gas line isn't rubbing up against something. Make sure that it's not clearly the wrong size, that sort of thing. On gas furnaces, size isn't usually a huge issue. Where we run into size issues is on pool heaters, especially on 400,000 BTU pool heaters, because just your regular old three quarter inch connector just is not gonna move enough gas for those and they're gonna st they start burning really uh, poorly and can actually produce a lot of carbon monoxide really quick. Um, and that's still dangerous because it can still get re, it can still get picked up into the home, especially if the home's under negative pressure and it's underneath the soffit, that can get drawn into the home and can still be very dangerous. So poor gas line installation to include, you know, gas connectors that are looped all over the place and rubbing against things and also uh, improper gas size, line size. Backdrafting or orphaned water heaters. So we're gonna run into orphaned water heaters mostly when we, because in our market, we're not replacing 80% um, with high efficiency. We're replacing a lot of 80% furnaces with heat pumps. And what that means is if you have a common vent, a common flue for your water heater and for your gas furnace, and then you get rid of your gas furnace and you leave your water heater just on that big old flue pipe, 
that can cause draft issues for that water heater, and often it will. So don't just assume that you can just leave that. Basically, at that point, just ask somebody who knows for most of you. Um, but if you notice that, if you go to a house and clearly a heat pump was put in and, and you see this orphaned water heater, pay attention to that because that is a risk for carbon monoxide. It is a risk for backdrafting. That makes sense with everybody, what I just said there? Okay. Improper gas pressure setting. That's the one thing we're going to do. Uh, don't assume that just out of the box, that thing's going to work properly with the gas pressure. We've seen this time and time again that it does need to be adjusted. I don't know why, but it, it does. Um, I think I think our gas companies are just all over the place with their input levels. Now the valve is supposed to accommodate for that, but it just doesn't for some reason. Um, so we so we do need to make sure that they're in the in the range of what the manufacturer recommends and generally right in the middle of that range. Um, high ambient carbon monoxide during operation. And so that would be um, in the home, around the furnace. We should have that low level carbon monoxide detector on our hip, just looking at it, making sure we're not seeing anything abnormal uh, in the space. Check the CO monitoring in the home. So if you're working on a gas furnace, that should be one of the things you do. Um, if, hey, have you changed the batteries on this lately? Could just check, make sure it works, uh, and then offer them that low level. I notice you don't have a low level carbon monoxide detector. What's a low level carbon monoxide detector? Well, it actually alarms for lower levels for a longer period of time, uh, and it will actually show you a display of what the levels are, whereas these are only for really extreme circumstances where you're about to have serious health issues. Uh, and then proper combustion air. Proper combustion air is one that we definitely do not want you to forget. If you're servicing a gas furnace, I'm not expecting you to do combustion air calculations, but I am expecting you to look around and say, where is this thing getting its air from? Where is it coming from? Because there are plenty of gas furnaces in Florida that are jammed in closets with no combustion air, or very, very little combustion air. And that's, that's a dangerous situation. <laughs> exactly. Very good. Thank you. Wow, you're really, <laughs> really losing it. <laughs> Took way too long. Um, what was the name of that band? Rock Dove. Rock Dove. <laughs> Rock Dove, yeah. yeah. They had a song called Dangerous Situation. It was a big hit. It was really a big hit. We're a local Christian rock band. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right, so these are some tools. Um, the one that you're not going to have on every truck is the combustion analyzer um, but we do have them so that's good you know you should be proud of us um, and the idea here is anytime we set up a new gas appliance gas furnace gas pool heater gas water heater i want us doing a combustion analy uh, uh, analysis on it it's not hard take this put it in the flu take a measurement super easy like this is not a complicated tool to use but it just makes sure that we're not putting things into service that are potentially producing high levels of carbon monoxide. This is your low level, um, your, sort of your personal protective carbon monoxide detector. Um, these are nice because they are there to protect you. In markets where there's a lot of gas burning appliances, that's a good idea to wear all the time. You know, Eric Kaiser wears his on his, on his uh, suspenders at all time. I don't know if there are suspenders. Oh, it's his backpack strap, that's what it is. Uh, and you'd be amazed how often those things will go off in public places. I mean, they've had them go off in restaurants, all kinds of all kinds of hotels where there's high levels of carbon monoxide, dangerous levels of carbon monoxide, and nobody knows it. Um, so it is a good thing to have on you. Um, but for us specifically, if you're going to go on a gas furnace maintenance, then I want you to all have one of these, and I want you to pull it out, and I want you to move move it with you through the space, and just ensure that nothing is. Uh, that there's not high levels of carbon monoxide. And I know some of you are looking at me like, I don't have one of those. Well, we'll just make sure you get one, okay? So um, the next thing is your combustible gas leak detector. These are fairly inexpensive. You can get pretty cheap ones. Um, and that's just to see, try to you know, find your source of a gas leak. Again, gas leaking is not the same as carbon monoxide. And then a manometer. And generally you're gonna have a couple different manometers. Um, we talked about how, uh, when we were here doing the airflow testing, there are precision manometers that are used for really fine measurements like zonal depressurization. But the one that you're gonna use for gas, she's pretty much just for your gas pressure and for measuring static pressure on your system. You know, your little field piece independent uh, ones that are part of the job link kit, they work okay. Uh, my favorite one is this one that, that Sam has out. And the reason is, is because it also has this, um, this pump so you can test your pressure switches for your furnace. So it's my favorite one for furnaces, for specifically for gas.
It's also nice because uh, it can reference either side or it can reference the two sides to each other. So it's nice for both static pressure and for gas pressure. Because for gas pressure, you want to measure your inlet pressure and your outlet pressure completely separately. You don't want to see them reference to each other. That makes sense. Like you don't want to see the difference between the two. When you're measuring static pressure, you're like, all right, this much negative, this much positive, add them together, that's my static. But with gas, you want to see what's my inlet, what's my manifold pressure coming going into my gas furnace. All right, skills you need. First and foremost, as always, the ability to visually inspect the operation of the equipment. Go through everything, visually inspect it. Make sure, oh, hey, look, there's a big burn spot on here. Oh, there's a bunch of corrosion uh, where condensate has been forming. The burner is damaged. Uh, something needs to be cleaned. Whatever the case is, just visually inspect. Look at the surrounding area, not just the furnace, especially the water heater or any other gas appliances in the area. The venting, your combustion air, where's this thing getting air from? Where's the flue gas going? What's the gas line look like? If I can get you guys to do that, and you're not already doing that on a maintenance, that alone would make a huge difference. Use a manometer to measure and set gas pressure, and that's both your inlet pressure to make sure that's correct, and your outlet pressure. Don't think that you can just adjust your outlet pressure, because many cases your outlet pressure on your valve, your manifold pressure, is low because your inlet pressure is low. Also keep in mind that your inlet pressure sometimes will only go low when all the other gas appliances are running, especially in a house that has pool heaters, pool heater or pool heaters, because it's just like water pressure. If you have, you know, two people taking a shower at once, what happens to your water pressure? It goes down. Depends. If you've, One shower or two showers. you know what? I, <laughs> you make a good point. All right, I water. can't dispute that. I can't dispute that. Never mind. I was going to make a crude joke, but my daughter's here, you know, she doesn't want to hear that stuff. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I was going to make a mommy and daddy joke. Anyway, so when the <laughs> when mommy and daddy love each other very much. Um, so when you have a 400,000 BTU a gas pool heater outside and you've got maybe even a you know, 70,000 BTU gas furnace and that pool heater goes on and it's drawing a lot of gas what's going to happen to the pressure on the gas furnace? It's going to potentially go down. And if you have issues where there's intermittent problems with the gas furnace, you may check that. If you wanted to do the best due diligence possible, like especially for installing a unit on a house, we should run all of the gas appliances and then check the gas pressure and make sure that our inlet pressure is not dropping below where it should be. Because we could have perfectly good CO levels, we could be doing really good under one circumstance and then have an issue in another. Now again, it's dropping your fuel pressure, so dropping fuel pressure alone isn't generally gonna cause CO issues, but it can cause flame to go where it's not supposed to go. So that's, a, that's another, another issue. Um, use a personal CO monitor to measure ambient CO and use a combustible gas meter to test for gas leaks, like we've already talked about. These are the skills you need. All right, specific service sequence. So you go up, you're gonna do a maintenance on a gas furnace. This is specific to Kalos. I do not wanna get grief from other people about our practice and how yours is better than ours. I do not care. This is our practice for Central Florida with the number of gas furnaces we have and the type of gas furnaces we have. First, inspect and clean burners. Now, for your regular gas furnace, there's not gonna be much cleaning to do. You're gonna look in, there's not gonna be any corrosion, they're gonna be shiny clean, nothing to do, right? If you're working with a gas pool heater, there could be significant corrosion, and that needs to be cleared out. Not cleared out so much that the entire thing disintegrates, but cleared out enough that you can have normal flows of gas. <laughs> check, check existing CO monitors and advise low level. That's where you go into the house, check and make sure those monitors are there, make sure they're working. Have you changed the batteries recently? Do you have batteries? I can change them for you, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and then uh, advise, you know, do you have a low level CO monitor? Would you like to know about them? It's a safety precaution. It's something that, you know, if I had a gas furnace in my house, I would certainly have that kind of thing. Uh, inspect and clean the flame rod. Now, again, if the flame rod is shiny clean, then there's no reason to clean it. Uh, your flame sensing rod is, uh, and I didn't actually talk a lot about this. I was going to talk about it earlier, but really all the flame sensing rod does is it just gets buried in flame. And by being buried in flame, it allows a current to flow from the board, a DC current to flow uh, from the board to ground. And so when you have a flame sensing rod, one of the biggest reasons why it won't sense flame is because A, the rod is dirty, B, the rod isn't properly inserted in the flame, or C, the unit isn't grounded properly. So it's almost always one of those three things. I'm gonna go through it again real quick. It's not, so first off, let's, let's back up. What will the system do if it's not sensing flame based on the sequence of operation we talked about? It'll kick off. It'll shut off. So it will first light, 
and then it will shut off. And then if you look at the blinky lights, the blinky lights will tell you that it had, uh, it, it couldn't prove flame, right? Didn't sense flame. But if you saw it there, like, all right, it was right there on that rod. There was flame right there. What's going on? It could be the circuit that connects the flame sensor, or it could be the flame sensor's dirty. Could be the board, sometimes it is, but not always. Um, or it could be that it's not positioned properly in the flame, or it could be that the system's not grounded properly. With pool heaters, it's often the grounding issue. And the reason is, is because the whole thing rusts out like a giant rust bucket, and so it stops that whole burner compartment isn't grounding well. And so, you know, at that point, if it's really that bad and it's just that corroded, then it's time to replace your pool heater at that point. But right into the fire, yes. Ground that fire right out, right. So the flame itself actually has ions in it that allow for a very small DC current. So if you want to test a flame rod, you can test it. I don't know if we have a meter here that will do it. Do you have a meter here, Sam? Not that. No? So you can test a flame rod or your entire flame uh, rectification system by actually putting a DC microamps, a meter that is DC microamps, not milliamps, microamps, and wiring it in series with the flame rod. So you literally unhook one lead from the flame rod and you hook your meter to one side and the other side to the flame rod. And so it's actually in the path. And then based on the, uh, the microamp output, you can tell whether or not uh, it's, it's working properly. And I was going to tell you what that should be because of course I have that memorized, but actually I don't because we don't do that that often. Um, inspect your venting, combustion air, and the combustion, oh, quickly, how do you clean a flame rod? Well, it depends on how dirty it is. Some people say, well, don't clean a flame rod because you'll damage it. Flame rods don't have a special coating on them. Um, if they do, it's just there to keep things from adhering to it. It's not like some special conductive coating. The reason why people think that is because with um, thermocouples, there was. With thermocouples, there were two dissimilar metals, and if you clean them too harshly, you could destroy them. With a flame rod, um, what happens when you clean them harshly is they get more pits in them, and so it just makes them more likely to get dirty again. And so a lot of people will just swap them out. In Florida, it's just a non-issue. If they get dirty, just clean them. And if they're really dirty, you can clean them with sand cloth. If they're just barely dirty, you can take a microfiber towel and just wipe them down until they get nice and clean. Check for gas leaks and proper piping. We already talked about that. Run the system, inspect the flame, look for displacement when the blower starts. So watch the flame. When the blower comes on, flame shouldn't do much. If it does, figure out why. It's probably not the heat exchanger. It's probably something else, but if it, you've eliminated everything else, then you can get you know a camera or something to go up in there and try to find if it actually is the heat exchanger. Don't do that with your uh, little blower door switch held closed with a zip tie and the whole panel off because that will straight up make a wiggly flame every time. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what I was saying. Yes. You have to have the door on the unit when you're testing. Yes. Yes. Always. Measure CO levels in around the space, measure inlet and manifold pressure and set in the center of the manufacturer specifications or by combustion analyzer. Now, even when using a combustion analyzer, I do not suggest that you go outside of the manufacturer specifications as far as pressures go. Um, but generally for us, we're just gonna set it in the middle there somewhere and then check temperature rise, which is just your furnace temperature split. So just run it in heat, check your temperature rise, write it in there in the panel. It's gonna tell you what your temperature rise is. It's a giant range. You just want it to be somewhere in the center of that range. You're good to go at that point. That's just on the furnace side. Obviously, if you're doing a maintenance and then it includes the air conditioning side, you gotta do all the other air conditioning things you do, air filter and all that stuff, drain line, all that. But for just the furnace, for our market, this is a very standard kind of furnace uh, furnace maintenance. There's not a lot to maintain on the furnace. There's not a lot to clean generally. They stay pretty clean. We don't have secondary heat exchangers, all that sort of thing. Now let's talk through some basics. First off, what type of gas is this thing running on? Propane. Propane, right? So we're pretending it's an LP. Now, what do you have to do if you've got a natural gas furnace and you need to run LP on it? You have to put a conversion transfer kit, like conversion a kit. conversion kit. Yeah, you gotta put a conversion kit on it. So this has already been converted. And that's why we got this little extra pressure switch too, because when you have LP, it's much more likely that you're actually going to have a low pressure event than when you have natural gas. Not a is no pressure event, but a low pressure event. And why is that? Because it's LP for low pressure. No. No, no, because close, because it's a tank and the tank will run out, right? So natural gas comes in with a meter from the utility. LP is a tank that's in your yard somewhere, and as that tank gets lower and lower, eventually that pressure will drop, and we want it to shut off before that pressure gets so low that you're gonna have an actual flame issue. 
Yes. How long do you think a Yachts furnace could run on a propane tank like that? Uh, we can do the math pretty easy, but uh, I don't know. I've never tried it and I've never done the math. So I'm sorry. That was really disappointing, wasn't it? Wow. Yeah. Not real long. It's not going to be real long. Yeah. You give me a lot of hope that you're going to answer my question. And that's another thing that will happen even with this tank is that as we run it, our inlet pressure is going to drop. Do you know why? Because hmm? the tank gets cold. Because the tank gets cold, right? Because what's inside this tank? Liquid propane, otherwise known as R290, which is a refrigerant. And as we keep taking stuff out of the tank, what happens to the pressure in the tank? It drops. And what happens to the liquid inside? It boils. It evaporates, right? And so it actually will get cold. That's why they get cold. It's got an LP conversion. It's got an LP sticker on it. So let's go and identify a few things. So come on up, come on up. First thing I want you to identify is what is our design pressure, gas pressure? Come on and see if we can locate a data tag that's going to tell. That's max pressure, it's half the PSI. Regular is 3.5 inches of water column. 3.5 inches of water column, but actually look on the system data tag. See if we can see anything there. Now, my guess is that we probably didn't put a sticker that M1 changed. M1 gas, 13.6 water column, mm -hmm. and the gas pressure, or minimum, so somewhere between 4.5 and 13.6. Right, yep, that's what, it, that's what it's telling us. So what is our designed outlet or manifold gas pressure for this? 3.2 to 3.8. 3.2 to 3.8, that's correct, if this was natural gas, but it's not natural gas. And whoever did this conversion kit didn't change the stickers or write anything different on it. And so even this gas valve isn't a new gas valve. It just has new springs put in it. So even what it says on it isn't correct. So our outlet gas pressure for LP needs to be what? Does anybody know? They put the sticker on it. What's it say? The control has been converted to use propane gas. No, oh, okay, but then it doesn't. It's got a barcode that we can probably scan. Oh, well, let's do that. Somebody, somebody put a put a QR on it and see what it tells us. I don't know. I've never, I've never tried this before, but you, you, you brought up a good point. So, not a chance. Nothing. All right. Oh, so, wait. conversion kit rating plate. What does it say? Oh, there it is. Yep. Okay. <laughs> yep. We got a big old sticker right there that we just didn't notice. All right. So, what's it tell us? Um, manifold pressure. The manifold pressure is your outlet pressure. High pressure eleven. Low pressure five point eight. So that that's if you have high and low fire. Okay. And this doesn't have high and low fire. This is a single. Uh, inlet pressure, minimum and maximum is somewhere between 12 to 13 water column. 13.6 water column. Inlet pressure 12 to 13.6 inches water column, and our outlet is uh, 11. That's for high fire, and we're running high fire. Gotcha. And 11 inches of water column is your standard outlet pressure for an LP furnace. 3.5 is your standard outlet, standard manifold pressure for a natural gas furnace. If we were to look for the orifice number, that this is referring to, where would I find that? That would be these little guys in here. Okay. That would be these little, these little spuds in here. How would yeah. I find the number for that? Because it's giving me like a reference number. That would be, uh, you would, uh, so this is, uh, your stock one is going to be your standard, um, yeah, your, your, your lowest number. It would be if you were at altitude and somebody had done a conversion on your orifices. What if, yeah. you know, we live in Florida and we're below sea level? Correct. Could be below sea level, yes. It is possible. It is it's possible. If it, was, it doesn't list that there, though, no. So we're really, we're really screwed now. We just give up. Let's go home. Just get rid of all the furnaces. Yep, just get rid of it. What is the most common fault on a brand new furnace that we just installed and you go back and the thing just won't start up? Gas valve isn't on. Yep, that's usually it. So it's this guy right here. Usually somebody forgot to flip that on or somebody forgot to turn that on. All right, so next thing we're gonna do is just run through the sequence of operations. So let's get our, let's get our gas valve open, get our gas cock open, which is the correct name for it. Go ahead and turn on our power. I'm not going to touch anything. I shouldn't touch anything. Let's go, Joel. Whoa. It's okay. It's gone for cool. I mean, I mean, you can. It's fine. Well, you can Whatever. Keep it on. But where's the thermostat? Let's see if we can even get it to get it up high enough. Uh, well, no, it shouldn't be emergency heat. Yeah, just put it on heat. Yeah, that's a multi-purpose thermostat. So it's saying it's 78 in here. It feels warmer than that. Get on up here, Joel. In Austin. What am I doing right now? You, you're just watching okay, it. So, okay, okay. so what's going on right now? Fire. No, not it's not yet. fire. What is that? That's the hot surface. That's hot surface igniter. Now click. There's our gas valve open. Now we have flame. Now it's proving flame. So the first thing it did, oh, inducer okay. fan spun. Well, it checked to see. Correct. So that it, it checked to see that it was closed first. Then it ran it. Then, then it closed the switch. Yes. Then the hot surface igniter heated up. Yes. And then it opened the gas valve, then it went and uh, produced flame. So now we're going to go ahead and test both our inlet and our manifold pressures at the same time. So in order to do that, oh, you saw what you heard what just happened, right? 
the blower here. Right. Were you watching the flame when that happened? I was. Okay. And did you notice any wiggly? I, not really. Not a whole lot. No. No. So then that would be what you would expect. If you had a big old crack in the heat exchanger, if the door was off or something and that blower came on, mm -hmm. it would uh, start moving around or you'd see some significant change. All right, so now let's go ahead and, and uh, turn it back off. Actually, let's do this. Go ahead and shut off, shut off the gas valve and just watch what happens. See this flashy light down here? Yeah. So it's gonna start blinking a code. So it's doing one, one, two, three, one, one, two, three. Oh, it is doing, oh, it's, it's three, one. Yeah, the, the, the sticker's kind of messed up there. The first digit is determined by the number of short lines. Pressure switch, right? Yep. Why would that be the, no, it'd be flame sensing. Why isn't it saying flame sensing? This is interrupting one of, this is just interrupting the safety circuit. So it's telling us that we have a, uh, an open safety circuit. Like I said, 31, obviously. Yeah, that's obvious. Okay, so now we're gonna go ahead and hook up our uh, manometer for measuring gas pressure. So this is our, yeah, this, this is gonna be our inlet port that we measure on. This is our adjustment, and then that is our manifold. We got it off, so we can go ahead and pull those ports out. We can tap in our manometer. Uh, we wanna do, we wanna actually check our um, temperature rise. All right, so thread these, thread these bad boys in there. Fingers tight, finger tight's fine. So here we have our carbon monoxide, our personal carbon monoxide sensor. And again, you should let this thing, you should let this thing calibrate out where you know the air is. So let it, let's carbon dioxide. So this would go to P1, that would go to P2. Now I'll go ahead and reset cycle power to it so it, uh, so it restarts. Go ahead and open both your gas valves or your gas cock is the technical name for that. It really is. All right, so our inlet pressure is 12.9. And so is that in our design range on our sticker? Yeah. So 12 to 13.6. And so we're within our range on our inlet. So now this is showing our differential. So we're gonna just switch it over to P2, and that's showing that we got nothing because our furnace isn't on yet. So as soon as our furnace lights, which it should here shortly, it's still flashing a code on us though, isn't it? Yeah. So first off, reducer fan, switch is proving that, and then we're gonna get igniter, hot surface igniter, once it has time to warm up. There we go. We have flame, and now we can see our pressure is 10.4. And is that what we're looking for? 11. We are looking for 11, which means we need to make an adjustment. Now, again, we're working off of a propane tank here. You are, you're gonna see a lot of fluctuations in pressure, but let's go ahead and make an adjustment. So first thing you gotta do is take this cap off. I'll let you do that, Austin. You're generally gonna use a bigger uh, screw, flat blade screwdriver than that. But that is, just a, that is just a cap protecting the adjustment screw underneath. And now in order to increase the pressure, this is just like a, uh, a regulator for your oxygen acetylene. You're going to turn it in in order to increase your outlet pressure. So go ahead and just start turning it inwards. With natural gas, this is gonna be a lot more. All right, so now we're at 10.8. Keep going, just a little bit more. It's pretty tight. It's pretty tight now? All right, so that's probably as far as we're, that's as far in as, as we're gonna get with this tank. But anyway, you get the point. That's how you make the adjustment. We probably totally ruined that valve now, but that's what you get for running it on a propane tank. Anyway, that's how you do it. We'll go ahead and turn it back the other way though and just see how low we can get it and see if that changes the flame at all. See how you're getting some more orange in that flame now? Does it look different? I wasn't really looking at it that carefully yeah, before. Yeah. Yeah, we're all the way down at 4.2 now. <laughs> did we, we didn't back it all the way out, did we? No, no. All right. So yeah, you can, you can definitely see a little bit more orange in it. Go ahead and take it back up to, let's say take it back up to 10. See if we can notice a difference now if we're paying close attention. Anyway, that's how you make the adjustment though. So when you're done, put the cap back on and this part is actually really important better that you go ahead and shut off the furnace breaker so go ahead and shut that off and then you close your uh, your gas cock you take your ports off and make sure you thread everything back together and that's that's the most important step to this that you don't leave your test ports out
So the main thing I want you to get comfortable with is just like, that's really easy to do. Like that's not a hard thing. And especially if you're putting in a new pool heater, even doing a maintenance, it's something that I would, I would like us to do. Um, you're gonna find a lot that are, and again, this is unique because we're running it on a propane tank that makes it act more tweaky. When you're working with natural gas, you're generally gonna check your inlet, just make sure it's in range and it almost always will be. And a lot of times you will find that your manifold pressure isn't quite where it should be. Now the next thing, once we get that all back together, we're gonna go ahead and fire it up one more time and then we're gonna check our temperature rise. So before we even do that, let's see if you can identify where it lists the, the heat temperature rise. It'll say air temperature rise. And then it'll give you, on this one, it gives you Fahrenheit and Celsius. Would it be like... Right this will be on the old tag because the new tag... 25, yeah. 25 to 55? Yeah. That won't change depending on... That won't change with the gas. 25 to 55? Yep. 25 to 55. Air temperature rise, 25 to 55 Fahrenheit. So you'll notice that is a huge, huge range. We're mostly wanting to keep away from... We're, we're mostly wanting to keep away from the high side. Um, but either way, it can cause problems if we get outside of it. If we get temperatures that are significantly lower than that, we could actually get into the condensing zone and we could start to create corrosion. So all we're doing is we can see it's 79 or so degrees inside here. So let's run the furnace again and just uh, give, it a, give it a few minutes of run time and then see what our temperature differential is. Yeah, just in the, just the air coming out. Yep. So see against the operation. Yeah, you don't need to, you don't need to do it yet. <laughs> it's all right. We're good. Let's see if you can spot the flame rod, Joel. Let's see if while we're waiting, if you can find the flame rod. It's the, flame. It's the rod that's sticking in front of it. In front of the flame? Right there. Yep, there it is. That's the flame rod. So this just goes back and reports to the board. And when there is a flame, there's a small DC current that moves to ground. So if this thing wasn't properly grounded, you couldn't get that current to ground. Rollouts. Got one right here. I don't think they call that a rollout. It's like a flu I think they temperature. Call it a temperature switch. Do they call it a temperature switch? It's yeah. temperature high limit one, high limit two. Yeah. And then this here's our this here's our high limit. I've seen other systems that they normally have a high limit on the floor housing itself, mm -hmm. but carrier doesn't have that. So that I don't know, I, I can't say why carrier doesn't, but that really is a um, like for downflow applications. Mm -hmm. So if it's downflow, now that the blower becomes the higher side. Right. So uh, if there is heat rise. Yeah. Yeah, I just I've noticed it on almost every other, maybe not every other, but plenty of other. I yeah, I have too. I've I, we had a good a good minute school that has it that way. So it's giving me a thirty three code. Is it? Oh, that's why. But this one's giving me right one, two, three, one, two, three. Doesn't really make great sense. No one of propane that has that low pressure valve would that be considered a limit switch in this application yeah but it looks like it's breaking yeah as, as sam was saying it's actually breaking the circuit for the um well wait a second yeah pressure switch yeah for the pressure switch so i wouldn't i don't know why it was flashing a limit switch code so if it's 80 130 would be what 50. my guess is that damper up top is probably closed that's a little on the high side of the range so we could either so first we check our airflow but then we could also just check our uh our blower settings for heat because they may be on the low side it's open right now it is open yeah so if we've got 50 degrees of rise that's within the range but it's like at the high end of the range so if you did one like this you ran into one like this you would want to go in and change your heating blower tap to a higher fan speed cool hot hot <laughs> all right all done thanks guys great class i did a great job thanks for watching our video if you enjoyed it and got something out of it, if you wouldn't mind hitting the thumbs up button to like the video, subscribe to the channel, and click the notifications bell to be notified when new videos come out. HVAC School is far more than a YouTube channel. You can find out more by going to HVACRschool.com, which is our website and hub for all of our content, including tech tips, videos, podcasts, and so much more. You can also subscribe to the podcast on any podcast app of your choosing, you can also join our Facebook group if you want to weigh in on the conversation yourself. Thanks again for watching.